But they were not yet people. Come here. As we describe what you'll see in front of you today, Daryl and I will also try to explain to you what you're seeing as far as formations, the way they're firing their weapons, the way they're fighting. So you get a better idea, historically, of how the Civil War was fought. You'll note the man out in front with the flag. He is a signalman, and he's using semaphore to signal troops across from him. You'll notice a company of infantry, Confederate infantry, has gone out in front of the main line. They are now dispersing as skirmishers. Skirmishers, as a battle develops, are very, very important because of woodlocks and hilltops and crests and valleys. You could not always tell where the enemy was. So you have to imagine the main force of an army as it advances a blind man. He cannot see far in front of him. So he needs to have the red the red pointed cane to find his head. And that's what the skirmishers do. They're a small body of troops spread out over a wide area and they advanced anywhere from 100 to 400 yards ahead of the main force, preventing surprise on the main force. That is their purpose. Thanks, Chris. I just want to you got some intelligence as to who the troops are that you're, that you're launching. Our Confederate Army, our 1st Battalion out on the field, skirmishers have been sent out, as Chris indicated. He's got the line of battle behind. That would be the 7th Virginia, the 7th Battalion Army of Northern Virginia, under the command of Colonel Tim Perry. That battalion includes the 33rd Virginia, Company G, 21st Georgia, Company A, 21st Georgia, Company B, and 5th North Carolina, the 33rd Virginia, Company E, 27th Virginia, and the 33rd Virginia, Company I. In the woods, hiding, don't tell the Federal Army this, is the 2nd Battalion, this is the Provisional Army of the Confederate States of America, PACS. Within that organization, it's their 4th Battalion. The battalion commander is Colonel Skip Wilson. In the 4th Battalion, PACS, is the 5th Kentucky, the 5th Texas, the 27th Virginia, the 11th Mississippi, and the 17th South Carolina. If you're rooting for the gray team, give them a big round of applause. Our Union Army is commanded by Major, and, and, and the Confederate Army is, I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce the commanding officer. It would be Major General Brian Gacero commanding our Confederate troops. Forgive me. Our Federal Army is commanded by Major General Bob Minton. Under his battalion, he has the Army of the Ohio under the command of Colonel Tim Bills. Bernie's Brigade under the command of General Mike Maffey and the United States Volunteers under the command of Colonel Kevin Skaggs. Our Federal Cavalry Commander is Colonel Mike Church from the USV Cavalry Regiment. Our artillery, both blue and gray, is under the command of Kevin Harris. And skirmishers have been sent out. The Union Army has been indicating that they are now to pursue the Confederate Army, and I'm gonna turn this back over to, to my colleague Chris and he's going to tell you a little bit more about what you're going to see. As the Confederate Army was being pressed by the Federal Army, they had a rear guard. The purpose of the rear guard was to protect the rear of the retreating army, in this case the Confederate Army. As Sheridan's cavalry pressed them from the south and Humphrey's Second Corps and General Wright's Sixth Corps came up on their rear. 
They found it necessary to stop their march, the rear guard, to stop their march, turn about, and face these forces. In so doing, a gap was opened between the rear guard and the rest of the Confederate Army, which continued to move westward. Into that gap, General George Armstrong Custer brought his division of Federal Cavalry, separating the rear guard of the Confederate Army from the remainder of the Confederate Army. This is what set up the Battle of Sailor's Creek. I might point out, as we're waiting for the battle to commence, in the main body of the Confederate Army, you will notice, uh, and you can see this by the the snare drum and the bass drum at the rear center of that Confederate line. Earlier I said it was very important for a regiment to maintain their fifes and drums. The reason for that was for the purpose of maintaining order in the camp, passing commands throughout the camp, but also passing commands on the battlefield. As a battle commenced, there would be far too much noise for a commander's orders to be heard verbally. He needed help. Well, they did not have technology that we do today. So instead, they used either a bugle or fifes and drums. And there were simple drum commands that could be beat by the drummer that would tell the men in front of them what they were to do. Stand up, lay down, load, advance, halt. These were the simple commands and it's all they needed. Yay, I go. Now, at the actual Battle of Sailor's Creek, the Confederate forces did not have artillery. It had been captured. This contributed a great deal to their defeat. Also, the fact that they had been fighting in the trenches, poorly fed, poorly armed, very little rest for 10 months, and then they had been marching for several days nonstop. But without artillery, it was very hard for the Confederates to maintain a defense against the Federal forces. In addition to that, they were greatly outnumbered. As the battle develops, once it begins, you'll see how they fight. But I have to tell you, the Battle of Sailor's Creek actually consisted of three parts. It was about, the battlefield is about six to eight miles long. The second corps of the Army of the Potomac, the Federal forces, attacked the north uh, eastern most segment of the Confederate rear guard. The sixth corps attacked the center, and General Sheridan's cavalry corps attacked the southern part of the rear guard of the Confederates. They had to stand and fight, outnumbered. It became very bloody. In fact, there was hand-to-hand -hand combat and there was charges and counter charges made both by the Confederates and the Federals. Very, very, very difficult, very sanguinary fight. The Confederates put up a whale of a fight, regardless of the fact that they were vastly outnumbered, regardless of the fact they had not eaten well, regardless of the fact that they had no rest. They were not about to give up. In our reenactment today, the Confederates do have artillery. We want to show you how that artillery operates, so you'll see that once the battle commences. There is a Confederate gun on the left of your front, here on the hilltop, and another one down to the right, all the way at the other end of the dam. Once the battle commences, uh, you
you will be very quickly awakened by the firing of those guns. I think we see our, our federal cavalry is now on the move. And now our artillery has opened fire. Probably at that rate, firing, firing, probably loaded rounds. Metal rounds with fuses on them, designed based on the range to explode above the troops. As those troops would get closer, those gunners would then s switch to canister, firing large two-inch balls, something like a big shotgun. Um, and now the Federal Cavalry is attacking the skirmish line set up by the Confederate Army. Chris, you probably see our Confederate General. He looks concerned. Again, with the Fifth Corps and the Second Corps coming down on them from the east and Sher Sheridan's Cavalry on their south, they are being fought from two different directions. They're already outnumbered. It's going to be a difficult fight for them. They have been separated from the rest of Lee's army. At this point, Lee's army only numbered about 45,000 men. This is only one segment of Lee's army. In fact, at the end of this battle, Lee will have lost at Sailor's Creek one-fourth of his forces. Sailor's Creek was the last large battle in Virginia. Lee would surrender three days later. Notice the smoke ring, it's caused due to the, the density of the humidity. Yeah. The center blast of the gun causes the air to... You, you were scared. I Confederate you forces are advancing. Again, notice the field music in the center. Commanding officer would be by that field music. He would give the orders to the field music. The field music would pass the orders to the men. Understand that what you're seeing is a microcosm of what would be a much, much laid larger battle. You'll note that the soldiers move in a mass. They stay tight together, shoulder to shoulder, two ranks. These are called Napoleonic tactics. These were the primary military maneuvers of the American Civil War. As the war proceeded at different battles, different instances throughout the war, they used more modern tactics, keeping in mind that these armies, or this Confederate army, just came out of the trenches of Petersburg, where they fought for 10 months. Trench warfare, very, very similar to what would happen in the First World War. In the open field, they stayed tight together. They had to. A commanding officer had no chance of winning a battle unless he had command of his troops, which meant that he had to be able to control those troops. Without the technology of today, the only way to control the troops is to keep them together in mass. If you lose control of the troops, panic can set in and you will lose the battle. Another role of the pipe and drums would be to keep morale up. So you're hearing the Confederate fife and drums play music while the men in that 
mass of troops in front of them are standing still. Sit their nerves down. The main part of the Confederate Army is advancing. Notice the flag out front. The flag served various purposes. It was the center of the battalion. It was what the men looked to in order to move forward. They, if you were to the right of the flag, you looked left. If you were to the left of the flag, you looked right. It kept you as the guide. It kept you in line. Confederate commanding officer is determined that the Federals in front of him are not large enough that he need to get away from them, and he did that through the use of the skirmisher. He has also decided that if he uses his entire force, he can press them, he can chase them from the field. We'll see if that's true. You'll notice that the Union cavalry is no longer on their horses. They're fighting dismounted. And the good general here can explain that far better than I, as he has a background in cavalry. Actually, the Civil War brought about a lot of changes in cavalry tactics. They started the war based on what they would learned from the Napoleonic days, when you could mass cavalry. And because of technology and ballistics, you could get close to an enemy line infantry without taking major casualties, which then allowed a force of mounted cavalry riding knee to knee to strike an enemy on the ground with great force and with a continuous and continual line of battle. Hoofs pounding, large horses running. Um, that was a quite a quite an impressive force. However, when they did that in the Civil War, things had changed. In the Napoleonic days, rifled, rifled muskets had not been invented. Range was only maybe 75 to 100 yards. And if you got within 75 to 100 yards of a line of infantry on a horse, you get the next 100 yards real quick. However, when they went to the Civil War, now they've invented rifled muskets, and now the range exceeds 400 yards. And unfortunately, as the cavalry mounted and charged, and they did that at the beginning of the war, they realized that with that 400 yards, they began to take major casualties, and the cavalryman's a pretty big target. Therefore, by the time they got to within that 100 yards and close to attack the enemy, um, they weren't now knee to knee. They had, the line had been disintegrated, and without that big, long force of energy striking the opponent, it really took the cavalry charge really out of its out of its realm. Therefore, they realized. Mounted cavalry against infantry was really ineffective. However, the speed of the cavalry, the ability to move from place A to place B, to ride behind the lines, to ride out in front of the lines, um, and putting soldiers on the ground after they you know, arrived at a destination and fighting on foot, made them not only more less susceptible to casualties, but also allowed them to provide better accuracy and better fire. The end of the war at Sailor's Creek, Sheridan's cavalry, Custer's cavalry, had repeating, had lever action repeating carbines. So then it allowed them to fire six or seven rounds before they would have to reload. That type of force on the ground became very effective. And so you're now seeing the Federal cavalry dismounting, using their carbines, fighting as infantry on the ground with their horses in the back, and becoming a very effective force. Good observation, Chris. Thank you, Darrell. I would also mentioned that when the cavalry fought dismounted, it reduced their forces by one fourth because you had to have one man out of four hold the horses. Uh, and he had his hands full with four horses while uh, his compatriots, his uh, partners in arms, would fire into the enemy. The infantry is the queen of the battlefield. It had, had always been that way. The infantry controls the battlefield. 
Interestingly, and Darrell has described that very well by describing the in inefficiency or ineffectiveness of cavalry on the Civil War battlefield. Very, very few times was cavalry used in an infantry battle during the war. Reason being the effectiveness and firepower of the guns of that time. Which makes it even more telling to know that Sheridan, at the Battle of Sailor's Creek, Sheridan's dismounted cavalry was able to best to outfight and defeat the Confederate infantry. The Confederate effectiveness had deteriorated that much by that time. To the left, through the trees, you'll see the main force of Federal troops in their battle line. They're opening fire on the Confederate forces. Notice not the entire line fired at once. They had various ways of firing into the enemy. Right now they're firing by company. This is a battalion of infantry consisting, it looks like, four to five companies in that battalion. The odd number of companies fire first, then reload. Only when they've reloaded do the even number of companies fire. By doing this, the commanding officer maintains loaded weapons in half of his force no matter what he's facing. You do not want to be facing the enemy without any loaded weapons at all. The very precise firing being done by that federal battalion they are not firing at will, as we call it today, what Hollywood would lead you to believe. They are firing by command. Their company officers and battalion officers are giving them the commands to fire. Just like today, the Army had to account for everything, including ammunition. So at the conclusion of the battle, the officers, company officers and battalion officers, had to report up the chain of command about how many rounds they expended during that battle. Now you'll note that the massive overpowering force of the federal forces, well fed, well rested, outnumbering the Confederates severely, are now beginning to have an impact on the Confederate forces, pushing them back. In the real Battle of Sailor's Creek, it was not so easy as we would portray it here. There were <laughs> assaults and counter-assaults. There was desperation on the part of the Confederates to defend the retreating army that they were now separated from. It was important to them if they were going to have to stay here and fight these federal forces, maybe, just maybe, they would be able to delay the federal advance enough that Lee and the remaining part of the army could get away. Union forces are pressing the Confederates. Confederates will give, but they will do so grudgingly. note the periodic firing of the artillery pieces. Again, like the infantry, they had to account for every round fired. But if they were in a heated battle, if they were in a heated battle, they could fire three to four rounds a minute. Confederates 
are, have regrouped and are solving the Union line. The Union line just fired by battalion. So, the Confederates are pressing them to the point that they felt compelled to fire a volley of the entire Union battalion. They would do this to get a dramatic impact if they knew that they could hit. A volley like that would have devastating impact on advancing troops. Now the Union line has been ordered to fire at will. Independent firing that they, is the command that they would give. Keep in mind that these right muskets that both the Union and the Confederacy are using are single shot four loading rifles. You have to put the bullet and the powder down the top of the barrel and press it to the breech of the barrel with a ramrod. A good infantryman could load and fire his weapon three times a minute. Union forces are now advancing again. Confederates will fall back. On the Union line, you note the little flag to this end of the uh, Federal Forces. That's called a guidon. It is an assistant to the, the colors. The colors are the regimental flag and the national colors that would be at the center of the line. The guidons would be at the ends of the line. The men maintain their order, rank and file, by keeping their line between the guidons and the central colors. This is how they kept control of the line.